Good evening. Good evening. We have talked so much recently about the second coming of Jesus and about judgment, and I thought tonight would be a good time to look at some good things about God, some, some more positive things, even though judgment really is going to be a positive <coughs> thing about God, but, but just something uh, more cheerful than, than the judgment, you know, death, Hades, heaven, and hell. So we're going to look at three pictures of God tonight from uh, Psalm 65. Now someone said that a picture is worth a thousand years, and we know we read the Bible and understand we don't have pictures in the Bible. They come from Bible times, and we have no pictures of God. But we do have word pictures in the Bible about God. It shows what God is like, not what he actually looks like, but, but just what God is like. And this particular psalm, Psalm 65, gives us three word pictures of God. Number one, the, fir the first word picture that we get is God is our merciful redeemer. That, that's a wonderful <coughs> word picture. Uh, however you want to get it formulated in your mind to think of somebody who is <coughs> redeeming you, and the redemption story in the Bible comes from the slave markets. That if a person was a slave, he needed to be redeemed if he, if he was ever going to be free. He was captured, he was put into slavery, and the only way he could get out would be to be redeemed. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But the psalmist praises God for constant communion and sovereignty constant communion god is in constant communion with us because of we'll talk about nature around us the evidence of god around us we also have god's word that is there but his sovereignty the control that he has over everything and it's a wonderful thing that god gives us free will uh, he lets us walk away from him if we actually choose to. That's not what he wants, but he allows it to happen to us. But look at Psalm 65, verses 1 and 2. Praise is due you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. Now that's talking about uh, you who hear prayer to you shall all flesh come that's talking about the sovereignty of God but praises do him and the, the most typical way that we praise God is with our voice whether it's the songs that we sing whether it's telling the story of Jesus <clears throat> the, talking about God but there that constant communion there's something going on back and forth so when we talk about worship Worship in spirit and truth begins with a desperate sense of our need for God. If we don't understand we've got a desperate need for God, then our worship really isn't going to be anything other than, than, than just a show that we're putting on for somebody. And I think there's a lot of people in this world, I, I, I know that, well, I don't want to say what I know. I, I, I think sometimes about uh, what I see going on in the world. And I can't help but think of some of the, the great singers who sing songs around Christmas time about Christ the King. And I know that they don't mean it because their religion doesn't believe that Christ is king. So how could they sing those songs beautifully? But yet we know they don't believe it. It's not from their heart. They're just doing it to, well, to make money. That's basically what it is. So they don't have a desperate need for God. So if they sing those songs, even if they sing them beautifully, they're not worshiping God. And they're not worshiping Jesus Christ. So worship in spirit and truth begins with a desperate sense of need. And we can sing prisoner behind a few bars and looking for the key. 
But if we have it with a desperate, we do it with a desperate need for God, that's something that pleases God. That's what God desires. We have a God who hears our prayers. We have a God who forgives our sins. He's our merciful redeemer. Often the least people know about God, the least that they do know about him is, well, God answers prayers. I know that about God. God answers prayers, so I'm going to pray because God answers prayers. Well, what does God want you to do so that he will answer your prayers? I don't know. I just know God answers prayers. That's the least they know. God answers prayers. And sometimes that's good because, once again, we go back to that, I've got a desperate need for God. If that's the case, God's going to hear that prayer. Now, he may not answer it in the way that they want it answered, but at least he's going to hear that prayer and consider it. Well, God has redeemed us Christians from our slavery to sin. We can't be saved if we weren't lost. And we're not lost until we're, we sin. But when we sin, we become slaves to sin. So God has redeemed us from our slavery to sin. Look at verse 3, Psalm 65. When iniquities prevail against me, when, iniquity, when sin prevails against me, when sin has taken control, when sin has put me under bondage, you atone for our transgressions. Wow, you, you, you see, do you see the change that took place there? When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our, <laughs> our transgressions. It's singular, personal, and then it's our as a, a group. That seems strange, doesn't it? That, that's not something you would normally, how would say? It, it should be, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone for my transgressions. Hmm. Excuse me. Well, that's true. But then again, Jesus died for me, but he also died for everybody who will come to him. It's a corporate thing, even though it's personal for each and every one of us. And this is slavery. It, it, it's slavery when iniquity prevails against it. It's, it's slavery, slavery like cap, being captured in a war. And instead of being killed, slaughtered, you are granted the right to continue to live if you'll be a slave. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll be a slave rather than die. Yeah, make me a slave. So the only, per, the only hope that a person who has gone into slavery because they've been captured in war, the only hope they have of ever being free again is if somebody redeems them, gets them out of that slavery. They don't have the resources to do it. They don't have any money. They don't have any power. They're slaves. So they've got to rely upon somebody else. They have to have a relative who can come and, and give gold or silver or whatever to redeem them, to purchase them and set them free. Or a good master who says, you know, you've served long enough. I'm going to let you go free. Emancipate you. Okay? How often does that happen? Well, our God is both a relative and a good master. Our God, we call God our Father, but we have to understand also that God's Son is our older brother. So we have a relative who is willing to redeem us. And he's a good master because the Lord is also our master. So he is our redeemer. Titus chapter 2, verse 13, the second part of that, and then verse 14, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness 
and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us. Uh, what did he, how did he redeem us? By giving himself for us. And we talked about, we talked about it from Ephesians chapter 1, 7. He redeemed us with his blood. Giving his life is how he redeemed us. So God has redeemed us from the slavery of sin and paid an ultimate price for it. And there are blessings. There are blessings because we have been redeemed. And this psalm talks about that also. Verse 4. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near. Well, who does God choose to redeem? Well, Christ paid the price for everybody, but not everybody's redeemed. Who's redeemed? Those who accept the redemption price by believing and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it was a little bit different for the people back in David's day. We understand that. I'm bringing it into our time period. But blessed is the one you choose. Oh, who has God chosen? The ones today, the ones who believe and obey the gospel. He chooses to redeem those. He doesn't choose to redeem those who do not believe in him. And he doesn't choose to believe those who refuse to obey the gospel. And he doesn't continue to redeem those who forget or refuse to remain faithful unto death. We continue. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. The holiness of God's temple. The holy okay, to dwell in his courts the goodness of his house, the holiness of his temple. Think of the courts, his house, the temple, in our time being the church, the courts, the courtyards. Usually the courtyard of something's a pretty fascinating place, isn't it? It's kept clean and beautiful so that you want to approach it. And, and the house, the house of God, what a, an amazing place that must be. And the temple, temple, the church. And the church is the people that it's set apart, the holiness of it, the goodness of it, the beauty of it, all of it's there. Now in the Old Testament, God was separated from the people. Remember we talked about it this morning, how the, the, in the, the tabernacle in the temple there was a curtain and God's presence was on one side and the only person who could go in there would be the high priest one time a year, but he could only go in there when it was full of incense smoke and only with blood. He couldn't see even what was in there, really. <clears throat> one day a year. But for us, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, this is in that one section, that unity section. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We're not separated from God because God is with us and God is in us and God is over us. There's a close relationship a symbiotic relationship that is there that wasn't there in the past. But, but David, or the psalmist at least here, is able to talk about that relationship that they had even when there was that separation, that curtain of separation. So what a tremendous access we have to God that even someone like David didn't have and the rest of those patriarchs back in the olden days. So God is our Redeemer. He is also our mighty Creator. 
That's the second word picture that we get here. And the psalmist draws our attention to this in three points here. All right, number one, the orderliness of the universe is evidence of God. In fact, the Psalms tell us, you know, the, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. The evidence is there if we want to look at it and see it. But the orderliness of the universe, Psalm 65, 5, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Go anywhere in this universe and the, uh, the evidence is there. It's there that God has created it. And how is it seen? Number one, or really number two, but it, it, God's power is infinite, which means it can't be measured in human terms. We can't understand it all. We can say God created all this out of nothing, but... Can we understand that? I don't know. I don't think so. Verses 6 and 7. The one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples. Now, in many places in the scriptures, the, the waves and the seas are represented figuratively uh, uh, as a figurative representation of peoples. And peoples are always in constant tumult. It, has there ever been a time of true just peace on the face of the earth? There's always war somewhere. There's always something going on somewhere. Somebody's always fighting somewhere. But just as God set parameters for the seas, and just as God has said it so that the tides are such, put all this orderliness out there, even in that there are ways that man can live together in harmony and doesn't have to have all this craziness that even we see going on in our own nation today. It just doesn't have to be. But we can't, un some can't understand that at all. So his power is infinite, but we only see things in finite ways. And number three here, God's creative power is known throughout the world. Again, from, from sea to sea and all around. <laughs> Look at verse 8. So that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. Why do we have morning and evening? See, because that's the way God created the universe. That's the way God created this world that we live in. The, the earth goes around the sun. So we have, <laughs> does the sun rise in the morning? No. Really? <laughs> no. But from where our vantage point, it looks like it's rising, and in the west, it looks like it's setting in the evening. It's, it's not really, but it's orderly because that's how God set these things in place. Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them. What can be known... Notice that? What can be known is plain to them, not that they know it, but it's plainly there, because God has shown it to them. For his invincible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Because what can be known is plain, but they won't look at it and accept it as being God setting this all in order. But just as important, God is not just a mighty creator, he's a mighty recreator. A recreator. Well, we got a word that we use, right? Recreation. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> I think sometimes we use that in the wrong way. Right? He's a recreator. 
We are created in the image of God, but because we sin, we mar that image back to that original image. And that's what salvation is, a remaking of that image. Now, down here in Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 11, that, that's called the parable of the potter. All right? Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he re reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. So as this potter, you imagine he's got this wheel and he starts it, it's spinning, he's got this lump of clay, he starts to make uh, a bowl or a cup or whatever, and he gets about halfway done and, uh-oh, messed up. So what does he do? Scrunches it down, starts over again. Okay? Now the rest, is it, the rest of this talks about what the meaning of that is for Israel. Okay? God's going to remake Israel. Remember I've told you that God judges nations in time and judges people in eternity? Okay? But just as there are cycles for individuals in life, there, there are cycles for nations too. And in Israel, Judah, really, at this time, Judah was going to be smashed down, taken into captivity, and brought back 70 years later and be reformed because of their sins. But about 100 years before that, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed. But it didn't come back. It, it was what we talked about before, like the potsherd. It had become so hardened in its sin and idolatry against God that God took an iron bar, just smashed it and broke it to pieces. It never came back. Now, certain of the people came back with the tribe of Judah back to Jerusalem and Judah from the Babylonian captivity. But that nation itself did not. You understand the difference in that? God was rebuilding Israel, the nation. But that's what God does with us also because we're like clay in the hands of him, the potter. And if we will allow him, he will recreate us into a usable vessel, even after we've <coughs> sinned. If we will have a soft heart to allow him to do that. He makes us into the image that he desires. Again, when it's hardened, can't be changed. It's not going to be changed, so he destroys it. We have to make sure that our hearts are softened, to listen to God's warnings, to his pleadings, to repent. <laughs> well, how long has that message of repentance been around? Since Adam and Eve, right? Constantly there. Now listen. If Jesus Christ dying upon the cross doesn't soften our hearts, nothing will. Nothing will. Third big point here, big picture that we're getting. God is our magnanimous provider. All right? Now the psalmist expresses several activities of God in continuous action in verses 9 through 13. So we won't read that. We'll just go down through this. Here are six things that the psalmist talks about. Okay? 
God visits us. God enriches us. God prepares us. God waters <coughs> us. What, 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 what do you mean, waters us? Okay? Well, you know that <clears throat> when you plant a garden this time of the year, you better put some water on it. <laughs> that, that seed's going to eventually get eaten by birds <laughs> unless you bury it real deep, and then the squirrels get it, whatever. But you water it. God settles us. Yeah, and that's like the seas once again. You know, we're tumultuous. We are, we are up and down. But when God comes into our lives, kind of calms us, right? Calms us down. Yeah, God's got control. It's going to be all right. And the sixth point there, he blesses us. Now, coming over into the New Testament, there are two passages that talk about this. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Peter says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life, because here we are, we're, we're living, right? But we want to live a good life. We want to live the, life, the abundant life that Jesus promised, right? Well, we can't do that if God doesn't visit us, if God isn't enriching us, if God isn't preparing us, if God isn't watering us, and settling us and blessing us. We, we won't have that abundant life, right? So, and then godliness, that's kind of the lifestyle that we need to have. So, how does he do this? Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Oh, who called us to his own glory and excellence? We're called to God through the Son, through the cross, through the gospel, the good news, by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises. Hey, a home in heaven, right? So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. You think that when God created Adam, that in some way God, uh, Adam was a partaker of the divine nature? Created in the image of God. And that's the image we want to be in. Sin mars that, right? We, we just talked about that a little while ago. And there we are. We're that, we're that vessel that God was making, but uh-oh, marred. Let's try to do it again. Let's try it again. And, and he does. But listen, how do we become partakers of the divine nature? Having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. We've got to have, talked about it this morning, a metanoia, a change of mind, and epistrepho, a change of direction, a change of lifestyle basically. So all these things, God provides for us. Now, now we're working in that process. We're growing to uh, have these blessings, these things come into our lives. Because God just doesn't heat them on us. God just doesn't throw them out there and say, there they are. I don't know. Uh, you... I, I don't even want to compare it completely to a, a, a Boy Scout working to get his Eagle Scout level. You got to do all these things. Not that it's it's that salvation is totally works related, but we've got to be adding things to our lives. Amen. And Peter talks about that in First Peter. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control. All those things we've got to be taking in, and it leads to these things that God provides for us, the, the enrichment, the preparation, the being watered, the being settled. All those blessings. 
of a godly lifestyle. And Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, where? In Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yeah. See, we're not in the church because we're in Christ. We're, we're, we're not in Christ because we're in the church. We're in Christ, or we're in the church because we're in Christ. I'll get it straight here in a minute. <laughs> Start <laughs> over. Yeah. <Don't> leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a little confusing. It's almost like a tongue twister. We're not in the church. We're not in Christ because we're in a church. You don't don't join a church to be in Christ. You're in the church because you're in Christ. And when you're in Christ, he puts you in his church. It's his deal. The result of God's providence is abundant production from the earth. And that's what verses 9 through 13 talk about. Okay? And more than needed... All these things, you know, the growth, the, the food that you eat. Think of what Jesus talked about. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about shelter. You follow what Jesus said, and you're going to have these things. You don't have to be anxious about them. Because he's going to tell you how to have a home, a house that will be a home. How to have clothing, okay? Uh, how to have food. He's going to, he's going to show you how to do that. You don't have to be anxious about it, like a lot of people. And, and more than what you need so that you can do what? So you can share what you got with others. Yeah, what a great deal. Now, creation itself, that which God has provided us, praises God. That's what the psalmist says. Creation praises God. And, and I think there are other passages in the scripture that I also talk about that. But look at Psalm 65, verse 13, 12 and 13. The pastures of the meadows overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Where's the praise coming from creation to God because of the orderly universe that he has created? You know, you plant typically in the springtime, except for winter wheat, you plant that in the, in the fall and it comes up in the spring. But, but typically, you plant something in the spring, it comes up and through the summer and into the fall, but but there's an order to everything that is there. But you think about it, the wind whistling through the trees, the rain when it comes drumming on the roof, the birds singing in the early morning, the coyotes howling as the sun sets. All of those things are nature praising God for the, the order that he has set in the universe. And if nature so praises God, should we not also be praising God for his great blessings that he gives and the orderly universe that he has given to us? Do we not have more to be thankful for than any other part of God's uh, creation? Because we have that hope of the for, uh, forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. Amen. God redeems us to recreate us. He, do, he doesn't redeem us to keep us in a slavery. He doesn't redeem us to keep us the same people that we were. He redeems us to recreate us, and he blesses us when we grow and become that vessel that he's recreating. That's the end of the lesson. I run out of stuff. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Anyone has a need, make that request known as we stand.